The struggle continues, everybody. The struggle continues. A luta continua. And now you can get your very own Politocrat Daily Podcast A Luta Continua t-shirt exclusively at the politocrat.com online store. The Politocrat Daily Podcast online store. The proper web address is the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com. You can also go to the politocrat dot com and scroll down. But to get directly to the store, it's the dash politocrat dot my shopify dot com. New merchandise added on an almost daily basis, all designed by yours truly. So shop now and buy, buy and buy from the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store. Thank you for your support. Yesterday, Yafet Koto, the actor, passed away at the age of 81. He was well known in such films as Live and Let Die, Alien and Midnight Run, among many others. He was also in Across 110th Street, if I remember correctly. Yafet Koto was a figure of immense presence, stature, charisma and excellence. He gave everything to the characters he played and he certainly should have had a bigger career than he had. If all was fair and equal and just in the world, Yafet Koto would have become one of the great screen legends. I truly do believe that. As such, he will always be remembered as a humble spirit, a passionate figure, and somebody who put excellence into everything he did on the big screen. Yapet Koto, passing away yesterday at the age of 81. May you rest forever in power, sir. My condolences to the family of Yapet Koto, who leaves behind a legacy of great, outstanding film performances. Again, in fact, Koto was 81 years old. Also, this past weekend, marvelous Marvin Hagler, the world champion middleweight boxing legend, passed away. It is not known of what, but the point is, is sadly, he is no longer with us and at the tender age of 66. It is very sad to report that he is no longer with us. Marvelous Marvin Hagler was known for his fearless commitment to his craft. And he was often cast as a villain. And I may have mentioned this previously, but I mention it here again now. He was often cast as the villain of the piece. But he really was a good person outside the ring. Who can forget those fights? Who can forget those memorable fights that he had against Thomas Hitman Hearns, against Sugar Ray Leonard? I will miss Marvelous Marvin Hagler, who believed in total commitment to everything he did, particularly inside the squared circle. Marvelous Marvin Hagler who I think never quite got the proper due and respect that he really had earned. And he certainly felt that too in his days. Is now no longer with us. He passed away over the weekend at the age of 66. My condolences to Kay Hagler, the now widow of marvelous Marvin Hagler and to all of their family may you rest in power as well sir both of these men represent huge losses 
not just to their professions, but also to the world. Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, March the 16th, 2021. On this edition of The Politocrat, is society changing? Do you think society is changing? And what does change mean exactly? Is it more about individual progress or is it about collective progress? And based on those two different things, is society really changing? That's something I want to explore and I will explore on this episode. And also a few other thoughts and news of the day. Coming up next. That's Bolero, Ravel's Bolero, from the London Symphony Orchestra. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much for listening to the Politocrat Daily Podcast. It's always greatly appreciated. I hope you're well on this Tuesday. And we move through this week. As we get to spring, by the end of the weekend, it will have uh, become spring in name, but perhaps only in name. I hope you are well once again. I, I thank you very much for listening. A lot to, I guess, mention, if not discuss. I mean, there will be the main topic, I promise you, that will get underway shortly, um, that I want to talk about here, about is the society that you live in changing? Do you notice change? And what does change mean? That That's what I really want to get at today. But I want to start first with just some news that you may or may not be aware of. And one of the biggest things that's happened over the last 24 hours or so is that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is being halted. Vaccinations of that particular brand of vaccine are being halted in several countries around the world. In fact, more than several is at least a dozen now at last count. Italy, I think Germany, um, and others are among those countries that have said no, no more. We're going to stop it for now because there are apparently uh, concerns and reports that in some people it is causing blood clots. And apparently um, a few people actually died, three or four, from this in one country or another. Um, And so for that reason... You've now had a lot of other countries react to that and say, oops, no, no, we're, we're going to do the same. We're going to postpone any further vaccinations until we get to the bottom of all of this. And at the moment, it's been at least a dozen countries in the Far East as well. There are reports that there are Asian countries that are also looking at banning or stopping for now the vaccinations of its persons with this particular Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, people who have defended the vaccine say that it's a very rare situation. There are doctors who have said this too, that it's a very rare occurrence for blood clots to come as a result of the vaccination. Um, But as you know, with all of this information, people just are absolutely frightened. And so they want to stay away from AstraZeneca. I mean, that's just the reality. And no matter what experts say, when there's news that someone has died or has suffered from a blood clot in relationship to this vaccine or anything in the world, people are going to shrink away. Most people will 
shrink away from taking AstraZeneca. People in the UK have been taking it. People in other countries have been getting the vaccine. Um, There have been issues with the vaccine that aren't related to blood clots, but certainly it causes panic, understandably so. So that's one thing um, on the table, just for your information, FYI, that the AstraZeneca vaccine is being um, postponed, suspended in a number of countries right now in terms of COVID-19. And I mean, here in the United States, I believe it's still available. Um, you know, I you know, if you're getting vaccinated, I guess you just got to <clears throat> either not ask them what <laughs> they're vaccinating you with or just hope that it's not AstraZeneca um, because that appears to be an issue right now. It really does. So though it is very rare, um, I do want to mention that to repeat that. Um, It's very rare that these kinds of medical conditions occur with these vaccines and with this one in particular. It is enough that a number of countries across Europe uh, are stopping any further vaccinations with that vaccine. Now, I do hope that you will be getting this vaccine whenever it is your turn. This vaccine, meaning a vaccine, meaning whether it is Moderna, whether it is Pfizer, whether it is the one shot Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is being made available in the United States, I believe right now, if not very shortly, please get that vaccination. I hope that you do. I understand that people are skeptical. Some people are terrified of needles. Other people um, have worries and concerns because, of course, the long-running United States government experiments on their persons, on their bodies, and the medical community's racist practices and its systemic racist practices against black people, where, as we see right now in 2021, there is a systemic effort it's not even an effort they're just doing it to not take black people's medical issues and problems seriously and their responses to those problems when a black person says no this is really affecting my health i am not feeling good this is not good for me i need to have tests run and you as a doctor say oh no 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 this is you don't need tests you need you can go straight home And you have to literally fight for your life against a doctor. Now imagine the specter of that. Imagine that. You as a black person have to fight for your life against a medical doctor who essentially wants to kill you. Doesn't take you seriously. Doesn't care about your concern. Doesn't care about how you're feeling. Thinks you're impervious to pain. You can take it. You can go home now. Take two aspirin and call me in the morning. And then you never wake up in the morning. So you can't call anyone. Because you're dead. So that's what the skepticism is. And that's the way it should be reported, as I've always often said, I should say, in the news media. But I do want people to get this vaccination. I hope that you do. Whenever it's your turn, please do it. Get it out of the way and continue to wear a mask or two or three. I don't think that people should be walking around once they've had their two shots or one shot, if it's the Johnson Johnson, um, with this notion that, ah, I've got the vaccine, so now I can just la di da di dee dee all over the place and just have fun and just start coughing all over everybody because I've got the vaccine. I've been vaccinated. No, it doesn't work like that. I think you know that I'm being a little bit facetious. But what we really have to do is continue to practice good health hygiene and good practices, which means cover your face with a mask 
Don't have it under your chin. Don't have it below your nose. Make sure it covers your nose and your mouth and most of your face except your eyes. And make sure it goes to at least under your chin, just a little bit under your chin so that it covers that whole area. And make sure you wear two masks because I really do think, and not just me, the CDC, thinks and says and has studied and shown us that wearing two masks offers better protection against this virus, which is still very dangerous. People are going to start lowering their guard because now the weather's going to start to get warmer as we get towards spring at the end of this week here in the U.S. and elsewhere. And although the weather won't be warm everywhere in the United States, there will be people, especially out here in California, who will tend to lower their guard. It's a human thing to do. But I do want you to be very careful. And I want you to be aware of your surroundings as well. Please, I've talked about this before. If you have AirPods, you know, those nice little uh, earphones you just put in your ears and they just stick in your ears, you know. Usually they're white and they're AirPods. You just put them in your ears and boom. I want you to only wear one of those. I just think it makes sense. You can wear both of them. I mean, I can't tell you what to do. It's just whenever I walk around and if I choose to put these things in my ears at all, because I also think it's good to just, why don't you just interact with nature and walk? You know, even though nature might be a concrete jungle for you, um, although for me it's not. I'm just a few um, steps away from some just lovely greenery. I'm just very fortunate to um, live in an area um, that you can have really quick access to. Lots of green and and the water is just beautiful. But my whole point is is sometimes it, you know a lot. You know it's actually good to take in your surroundings without having some music in your ear all the time. I get it. You don't want someone coming up to you and bothering you. And the Lord knows that even if you have something in your ear that you're listening to, someone, someone is going to come up to you and, and annoy you or bother you. I know. I know it. I Believe me, I know. Um, but I do think it's really good to have your senses about you. Just to be careful, this is not about being paranoid. I'm not trying to scare you. I hope I'm not scaring you. It's just good to just take stock of what's going on around you. So that's, that's there's that. And I want you to know something as I go from thing to thing that I'm saying here. I want you to know something. It would be good to wear gloves. It would be good to wear some gloves. Do you, I mean, I think gloves are important. I know that, you know, the surgical gloves that they're available in your local grocery store. I have not stopped wearing gloves since this pandemic began. I have not stopped wearing them. I mean, it's been a year plus and I am still wearing them. Whether it's raining, whether it's hot, whether it's cold. And I do the same routine I have not stopped and I don't think I'm going to stop wearing gloves for another year at least. You know, I, I mean, until I am comfortable that this virus is under control, whatever that means. The gloves are going to stay on. The gloves will not come off. No chance is taken with this virus. No chance is taken. As long as the media starts to slip its focus away and starts talking about other things, people in general, because the media, of course, is so extremely powerful, they're going to start doing the same. So I want to warn against that. I want to also say something else to you. You have greatness in you. Right now. You have all the tools. In you right now. And I want to remind you that you are great and that you have greatness in you. 
everybody who is listening to me right now, I am telling you that you have greatness in you. And what you have to do, dear listener, is to first be aware that you have greatness in you. Second, think about it. And third, tap into it. Find what it is that you are great at because you have at least one thing that you are great at, that you are really good at. And I've talked about this before here on this podcast. And I want you to write that down. And I want you to think about how you can apply that greatness to something that you do daily. And really promote that. You have greatness in you. Now, all you have to do is tap into it. It's All In You by Eddie Grant. As I was saying, greatness is already in you and you just have to tap into it. Now, how you tap into it is obviously a journey that you have to take and execute in the way that you know how to do that. Now, that might involve counseling. That might involve self-discovery that might involve any number of things in order for you to even tap into the greatness that you've got in you right now because you've been told perhaps by people by some people even in your family that you aren't great that you don't have greatness in you and that's called abuse and that's called lies among other things it's called emotional abuse maybe you've been taught that maybe you've had that drummed into you by an abusive spouse or by someone that you thought was your friend or someone in your family, as I said. So it is all in you. I just want to close that part of the kind of thought that I had is that it is all in you, dear listener. And I want you to today begin to tap into those reservoirs of greatness that you know you have. It's a muscle that maybe you haven't flexed in a long time. Maybe you are afraid to flex it. Maybe you do have some fears around that. Sometimes people are afraid of unlocking the power that they have. And there's many, many reasons for why that might be the case. It's a perfectly normal thing to have that kind of fear. And in recognizing that, there has to be a pushback against the fear that you might have about unlocking your true greatness, what you've got within you. You have to shine that light. Now the question is, how do you find the light switch? That's the question that I think a number of people in the world have. I want to shine my light, but I'm having trouble finding the light switch in the first place. And once you find that light switch, you will become unstoppable. So I just want to leave that thought with you before moving on to a couple of other things. We have had the Metropolitan Police Officer in England who over the weekend had been charged and I told you that this would be the person and I told you yeah and I'm going to brag about it here (laughs) I told you uh, on Thursday 
during the episode I did on Sarah Everard and all women and institutionalized patriarchy and men and and the solutions that we've got to get to and start implementing. I told you that this 48-year-old father of two police officer in the Metropolitan Police would be the one that would be charged. And I think he's guilty as hell. I know he's got to be put on trial and all of that. And yes, 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 I know, innocent until proven guilty. But I told you, dear listener, that this person was going to be the one charged because there's no way that the Met Police would have arrested him as quickly as they did if they didn't have some real significant evidence about him. And the clue for me was when they apparently arrested a woman. I think that was actually his wife that they arrested. And they had let her go and reminded her either in custody or reminded her until an appearance in court at the Old Bailey. And once I heard that information, as I was concurrently hearing in the press that, well, they're still questioning him, him meaning Wayne Cousins, whose name I proudly told the world the other day, although I'm not proud, um, I'm not trying to be gleeful about saying, well, he's the one that killed her. I'm, I'm saying that his name should be put on blast so that we all know it because you know well that if that was me and it never would be of course but if that were someone like me charged with or even suspected of some kind of heinous criminal act i mean if i was if i mean if i if i had you know tripped on a banana peel and the banana peel hit somebody in the face say the governor of california just at random picking randomly picking somebody i that would be in the papers and I, I bet you my face and my picture would be all over the place arrest the man put him in custody i mean yeah okay i'm being facetious there but You know what I mean. If it was me, if it was someone else who was black, oh, forget it. Our faces would be all over the place. Name released. Oh, but he's a white male police officer. We've got to protect his identity because he's, you know, he's not been arrested yet. He's not been charged yet. That's, by the way, that's the law in England. I'm not trying to make fun of that, but, you know, I am. That is the law, is that they don't release the names of people um, until they are charged because there are libel laws in England that are very strong and severe and the person who has been remanded in custody or at least been questioned if that person is being said to have been acute uh, be the murderer or anything like that and it turns out the police release him then he can turn around and sue for libel sue all the English newspapers, which is why Sky News went to great lengths last week, or we're not going to show his picture on our air. Even though half a dozen newspapers in England had his picture and his name on it. So they were pretty darn confident too, you know. But anyway, that's a whole nother thing. They have strong laws in England about this. Um, But anyway, the point is, is that Wayne Cousins... I think is guilty of sin. He appeared today before the Old Bailey in in London, the venerable courthouse of criminal prosecutions, the Crown, and Wayne Cousins were... Actually, he didn't appear there physically. Uh, I should be clear about that. He made an appearance at a hearing there over closed-circuit TV via video link, um, from Belmarsh Prison in South London, South East London, I believe, um, is where Belmarsh Prison is. And that's where he has been in custody since last week. And that's where he's going to stay in custody. And the next appearance for him will be July 9th before the magistrates. Uh, and his trial date was set today for October the 25th. Good grief. Seven months and nine days from now. And by the way, all the while that these seven months are transpiring, he will be behind bars. So at least that's good because, you know, 
sometimes here, a lot of times here in the United States, especially if you're rich, I should say, if you're rich in the United States, you get to be out on bail. You get to wander the place. You know, you get you get to walk around and smell the air. But thank goodness he doesn't. He's not rich. But I think he's a murderer. Wayne Cousins, father of two, a metropolitan police officer in the VIP parliamentary diplomatic unit. He protects diplomats. He protects VIPs. And I think no one's talking about the institutionalized nature of all of this violence. No one is. A few people get on Sky TV, Sky News, and they talk about it. And then they get swiftly kind of pushed aside, not pushed aside, but, oh, they're going on to the next story now kind of thing. Because those individuals who point out the institutionalized violence against women, they end up, you know, getting, you know, like I say, it's like they hit a nerve with people and those in power or those representing those in power are told to move on. I mean, these protests this weekend, and it wasn't even there was so much protest, it was many women showing up at a vigil to pay their respects to Sarah Everard, who is the 33-year-old who was killed, and I think she was killed by Wayne Cousins, while she walked home two weeks ago now. Tomorrow will be exactly two weeks. And, you know, her remains were found, for goodness sakes. And they were found not far, apparently, from the home of Wayne Cousins. Then in prison last week, Wayne Cousins alone in his cell. Oh, he's got head injuries. I wonder how those happened. I mean, when you heard that piece of news, surely you must have thought, well, why would he be doing that? Hmm, I wonder. This is about power. And I think in some strange ways, and maybe you will take issue with this, maybe you're not. I think in some strange ways, the thuggish behavior of the Metropolitan Police throwing women to the ground and putting knees in their back. I mean, you didn't, obviously they didn't care about what happened to George Floyd almost a year ago. You had these two male officers on top of Patsy Ferguson, I believe her name, Patsy Stevenson, excuse me, on top of this fight, it doesn't matter if she was six foot two, she's five foot two, as it stands, or as she stands. But she didn't stand because she was on the floor face down with these two white male cops with their knees in her legs and on her back, handcuffed, handcuffing her. I mean, this is... This is the fascism in the police now. And nobody wants to really talk much, except for the people who demonstrate and protest in England, in London, particularly. No one wants to really talk about, where's the conversation about this in on the BBC? Well, you'll never see it there. You'll never see it on the BBC. But I think in some ways, those protests, but especially, I should say, the police response to people just observing The vigil, the vigil for Sarah Everard has somewhat overshadowed the actual murder case against Wayne Cousins. I actually think that that has been put a bit more to the back burner, particularly in the press. Now, obviously, the people who have paid respects to Sarah Everard are not doing that either. They're certainly not doing that at all, I should say. But the media, I think, are. And yes, they have reported today on the appearance via video of one Wayne Cousins. And they have reported that, yes, October 25th is going to be his trial date. And yes, they've talked about all of that. He'll make another appearance on July 9th, which is now what another almost uh, four months from now. During the summer, where most people would have already forgotten about Sarah Everard. Some people will not have, but I think the majority of people in England would have just moved on. I mean, that is just, again, the way we as human beings are. We have very short memories. And I decry that, but we have very short memories. But I do think there is 
a sense that what the Met Police did over the weekend to these women who just standing there, and I, there's no excuse for what the police did. I don't care if a woman was, put it this way, I don't care what happened. These police are trained to deal with it. And all of the women that I have watched on television who were at that vigil had said it was entirely peaceful. And if people are worried about women raising their voices and they call that threatening, good grief. What kind of world are we living in then? So a woman raises her voice and she shouts to be heard and all of a sudden now you're, you're arresting them? You're afraid because a woman dare open her mouth and speak? And, and, and raise her volume level. And so that intimidates police. So you're intimidated, Mr. Police Officer, by a woman doing what a man does when, when she just raises her voice to be heard like any man does. And then you set upon her and you throw her to the ground. Really? Do you really think that we're going to take that and we're going to believe it? And we're going to think that that justifies you? Really, you're going to behave like the thuggish Gestapo that you actually are? Welcome back. So to just close the loop on that last thought... I do think that English society has become more fascist. And I don't necessarily think that that's ever gone away. Um, If you look back to the 1960s and the way um, black people were persecuted and still are in a number of ways and still are being killed by police, including Met police. And we've seen the dismissive aspect of police to black people's pain, to black people's suffering, to black people who've had crimes committed against them. And the lackadaisical, I don't, you know, the I don't care approach. We've seen what happened to Stephen Lawrence and the way the police responded. We've seen what happened to Mark Duggan. We've seen what's happened to, I can go on and on and on and on and on. Demelola Taylor, when he was attacked by a bunch of thugs who were were black, you know, and, and killed, he was only seven years old, knifed to death. In London. And the police just, you know, they finally got, I think they got a couple of the perpetrators who did it. But again, you know, again, the police really doing what they do best, which is, I think at least, criminalizing black people and being thuggish. Being thuggish against black people and against women of all racial groups and backgrounds. We saw that over the weekend. And that is, I think, the reality. And this police bill is going to make that happen even more often. If you really get right down to it, the police and crime bill, the Policing and Crime Act, I believe it's called, is going to be introduced into the House of Commons for a vote. And it's going to be this week if it hasn't gone by already. I certainly don't think I've missed it. They debated it yesterday in the floor of the House of Commons. And we will see. Um, What happens? Labour, as I said, are voting against it. And the Conservatives obviously won't vote against it. So it's going to pass. This is going to really curtail people's ability to protest in England and across the UK. I'm telling you now, you're going to have this fascist state. A police state is really already here and already has been here, not just here in the US, but here, meaning here in the United Kingdom. It's very apparent. And that is a road to ruin. You've got Brexit, a failure. I mean, Polly Toynbee in the Guardian newspaper today, Polly Toynbee, who's been one of the great writers at that paper and others over the years, talked about this, mentioned this in her column from today, the title of which is called The Brexit Deal Was Astonishingly Bad and Every Day the Evidence Piles Up by Polly Toynbee, T O Y. N as in North, B as in Bravo, E-E. I'll actually put a link to that in the episode. You have to read that. And she mentions, she starts out by saying, now we know that British exports to the the European Union plummeted by a cataclysmic 41% after Brexit on January 1st. I mean, and the, the English press 
surprise, surprise, is not talking about Brexit now. They're not talking about the fact that British exports to the European Union plummeted by 41% after the first day of Brexit on the first day of this year. It's completely mums the word. You have to read that article. I'll put a link to it. So we're seeing what's happening. We're seeing Brexit as the fast that we knew it was or that many of us knew it was. Now it's not being talked about. If Brexit was so great, why aren't you hailing its success, Boris Johnson? And not just hailing it when you signed the deal and you raised your arms aloft as you did in those pictures on December the 26th. Or whenever that was, either Christmas Eve or December 26th. I think it was Christmas, whichever one of those two days. And you had your arms aloft and you're celebrating. and you're Where's that victory lap now? 41% of our exports really is gone down, is plummeted by 41%. Very, very smart, Boris Johnson. Very smart. So that's where I want to leave all of that. And I want to now go on really to the main event of this podcast, which is, is the society changing? Is our society changing? Do you believe that the society is changing? And I'm not talking about demographics. I'm not talking about our society becoming more black and brown. That's not what I'm talking about. That's something that has been known for at least 30 years, that we would reach a time where white people were no longer the nominal majority of people. And certainly that's true here in the United States. Now, in the United Kingdom, it's a little bit different, but you will start to see the same thing happening there, where you will have more black and brown people in the United Kingdom. And you will start to see the homogenous population start to diversify more and inclusify more, I hope. At least by face and by pure being, it will. And while that certainly has happened here in the United States, in California here, for example, you have a majority Latino and uh, black population, majority Latino population here now in California. It's pretty much here now already in the state or it will be very soon if it's not but in the next five to ten years that's how i define very soon at least in for the purposes of this particular um, discussion so my question for this episode for you is is society changing and let me expound is society changing Or is it that more people are diversifying a system that remains the same? Is that latter thing the thing that's going on? And do you think that that's the same as real change? Well, I think the first thing to ask is, how do you define real change? What is real change? change to you because over the last few weeks we have had some firsts here in the United States we have had our first female vice president she was sworn in that she being Kamala Harris Kamala Harris was sworn in on January 20th the first female vice president of the United States That's just this year. That's less than two months ago. She's also the first black person to be vice president. She's the first black woman to be vice president. She's the first South Asian woman to be vice president. We've had other firsts over these last two months. Janet Yellen has become the first female Treasury Secretary of the United States. Lloyd Austin has become the first black Defense Secretary in the United States. 
Colin Powell didn't even have that job. You would have thought that he would have been the one. Or in fact, you would have thought that there would have been one before him. Russell Honore, my goodness gracious me. I think he could have probably been a, a defense secretary. And most recently, yesterday, Deb Haaland, congratulations to all of these individuals, but Deb Haaland became the first Native American to be a member of a government's cabinet in a presidential administration. She's the first government official in the White House in the history of the United States part of a president's cabinet as the interior secretary. She was voted in yesterday 51 votes to 40 by the United States Senate. Confirmed a history-making confirmation. It's the first time we've had a Native American be in a government position in a presidential administration. This is after 240 Four years. The first time. And we're soon going to have our first trans woman in a presidential administration. That's what we're going to have soon. Rachel Levine. I believe that's how I'm pronouncing her last name. I hope I'm pronouncing that. Correctly, I don't think it's Levine, but if it is, I apologize to you. Soon to be Assistant Health Secretary. Rachel Levine is going to be confirmed soon as the Assistant Health Secretary in Joe Biden's administration. She appeared a couple of weeks ago now in a Senate hearing and maybe two or three weeks ago, actually three weeks ago, maybe. And the hostility from Rand Paul. I know he won't be voting for her. I think Rand Paul is a disgrace. And he has no business being in the United States Senate. So I hope that Kentucky voters give him the boot. And I think they eventually will, based on what I've been noticing about the trends in this country. And how we've seen um, people standing up to do more progressive types of things. To make that progress. But I mentioned all of these names. You know, I mentioned the Oscar nominations. The first Muslim actor to be named Best Actor. Nominee. Riz Ahmed. I didn't point that out yesterday. I said that he was the first, but I didn't mention that he was the first Muslim actor. I didn't say that. But I say it now. First Muslim actor. You would have thought that in all of these years, we've had Muslim actors in Hollywood films forever. They've been demonized. And after all these years in film, in American film, in Hollywood, at the Oscars, at the Academy, there's been no Muslim actor, really, as a nominee for Best Actor? You would have thought that would have happened by now. But it happened yesterday for the first time ever. We have the first Asian actor to be in the Best Actor category, an Asian man, Stephen Yun. The first, I hate this term, woman of color, because we don't say women without color. I mean, if you're going to say woman of color, why don't you also say woman without color? Because you're trying to otherize people. And yes, the way that you deal with people is as I deal with them by saying white woman, black woman, Asian woman. So you name them, you identify them instead of lumping them into a group without distinction. I mean, we're not going to walk around here saying the white Irish woman and the white British woman and the white American woman. We we don't do that for a living, right? None of us do. So why are people saying things like woman of color, woman of color, and you don't distinguish who she is? I don't know. I I just, again, I've talked about this and you, you and I know this. And I've talked about this a million times here. I probably bored you to tears. This whole thing about language really means something. It's really important. The kind of language we idly use and we don't think. And that's the thing. It's like the whole Malcolm Gladwell thing about blink, the blink theory. Blinking. He wrote a whole book about this. Blink. 
all these subconscious things and these things that we woman of color. Why are we as a society not identifying who these women are? Why aren't we saying Asian women? I mean, some of us are, but I mean collectively. Why aren't we saying that? Why is it we're lumping women of color together and not identifying them? And I think the reason why is the way of whoever does this, white people who are part of the system, the people who really control this system, do this to try to make the world smaller than it is. Try to shrink the world. It's a small world. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. But I don't think that 9 billion people or thereabouts is exactly a small world. I think that's a whole lot of blooming people. (laughs) It's an overpopulated world, but it ain't small. And I just think that sometimes language is used as a as a limiter, as a delimiter, as a limiter, as a way to shrink persons and not identify this vast array of humanity, this wonderful and crazy and sick and beautiful and inspiring and creative humanity that we have here on this planet. And so anyway, that is something to think about. And then yes, they also, as I said, uh, the, the women as best director, first Asian woman to be named best director nominee, Claire Zhao for Nomad Land. She's going to win. I mean, let, let's have it right. She's going to win. And Emerald Fennell, who's from England, by the way, a white English woman. Here I go. Um, from England, she um, directed Promising Young Woman and she did a really good job. I am really not happy, though, about Regina King not being on this list. I mean, come on, really? That was not a well-directed film, One Night in Miami. I know it was based on a play. I know, I know. And the screenplay, yes, it's adapted. It's a good screenplay. But my goodness, there's no directing nomination for Regina King. I know. I'm still hung up on that. That was only 24 hours ago. Uh, And the first time that two women were in the same Best Director nominees category. So they're all these firsts in entertainment and in government. Here in the U.S. is my point. Is that a sign that the society is changing? Or is that a sign that the system is just diversifying and inclusifying? Because I'm going to burst your bubble here. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you that I beg to differ with the notion that we are really undergoing this society-wide change. Sure, there are aspects of society that are changing. Sure, there are laws that you and I have voted to imp- to have implemented through the politicians that we vote for and through lobbying Congress with our phone calls because we're lobbyists in that way. We're not getting paid millions of dollars a year, but we are lobbyists as people who are paying the salaries of the government officials and politicians that we elect on local, state, and the federal level. I mean, we are. We're lobbyists in that way. We're voters. We do this. We call people. We text and tweet them and email and write letters to them. Come on, it's all there, isn't it? But, you know, what I'm saying is is that is society changing? I don't think it's changing as much as it should at this point. So that's where I stand. I think what we're seeing is a more diversified system. We're seeing a structure that stays the same. A system that is deliberately broken because that is the system. It's broken. That is how it's designed. And that is staying the same while the people who come in and out are changing. And you know what they say about that. The more things change, the more things stay the same. And I think that's what's happening to a degree. I think that while Janet Yellen as Joe Biden's Treasury Secretary and Lloyd Austin and Deb Haaland, I'm really pleased about Deb Haaland um, coming in as Interior Secretary and Rachel Levine will soon be 
confirmed, I'm sure, as the assistant health secretary. I think these are all great things on a personal level for each of these four individuals. I think it's excellent. I'm very happy for them all personally. I'm happy, obviously, for Kamala Harris, the vice president of the country. I'm very happy. Again, I will never fail to talk about that photograph that I took with her just, you know, just over a year before she became the vice president of the country. I still have the, the, you know, know, I'm framing that. I mean, shook hands with her. We both smiled into the camera. And now she's vice president of the United States. I mean, that's just, that was just over a year. That's a year and a half ago. Now, almost a year and a half ago, that picture was taken. I met her at a fundraiser. It was just, oh my God. She's incredible in person. Just to talk to her. She has got a really easygoing way about her. She seems to be so unassuming. And it's as if you're talking to somebody that you've known for a long time. She really puts you at ease. Not that I was uneasy around her. I was certainly excited to see her because, my goodness me, she is from this part of the world. I mean, Oakland, California is where she's from. Um, She's here in San Francisco. She was here in San Francisco as the San Francisco district attorney. And, of course, there were some valid criticisms of some of the things that went on, although there's a lot of misinformation around that as well that made it seem as if she was much worse than she was. She was the attorney general here in California. So, wow, that's I was excited to see her. You know, she's someone who had really made her way in the political realm. And then to take a photo with her and talk to her, it's terrific. And I'm very happy for her. So all of these people, five people, Harris, Yellen, Austin, Harlan, and Levine, who will soon be confirmed. And then you've got Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark who have already been in the Obama Justice Department. And they're going to soon be in Biden's Justice Department under Merrick Garland, who got in um, last week. I'm happy for for all of the individuals, but is the society changing? Is the system even changing? I don't think it is. I think if you're really honest with yourself, you'd have to say no, wouldn't you? I mean, and any change that the system is doing is only because we are fighting for it. And we have to still fight, because even then, as I talked about in the beginning, there's a perpetual fight. We don't just go back to sleep like we did during the Obama years, because the Republicans are conjuring up something different. It's a complete brew, another potion that they are concocting. And this time, as I said last week, it's voter suppression again. All this legislation that's being passed in Arizona, in Georgia, and elsewhere to curtail the amount of black and brown people who get to vote. Latinos, Latinx, native peoples, young people, elderly people, black people. This is what's going on. So the system is not changing at all, in my view. On the one hand, you've got these cosmetic changes, and I know that's a horrible thing to say. And I know some people would go on and say tokenism. It's not a word I like. I don't like that word at all. But in a very real sense, you could look at it as, we'll put some black people here, we'll put some black people there. But I find that there is very little conversation in the corporate news media well I don't watch it anymore but when I did watch it one of the things I found and that I'm sure you know before I found is that the conversation is never often or I should say is rarely about the collective society if it is it's in a town hall that gets wrapped up in a neat little bow for an hour And it's usually chaired by all these celebrities who have made it into a system already and are now turning around and telling you that this is how you make it in a system that oppresses you. Now, they don't use the word oppresses. I use it. But I am translating the optics of what is actually going on and what the subconscious and subliminal or sub, you know, sub, uh, the uh, whatever you want to call it, the word that I'm not trying to find right now or can't. The subtext is what I'm trying to say. On the, the subtext is 
that these black men, Charles Barkley, are telling you, black folk, Magic Johnson, have to pull up your bootstraps and then you can join us in this system that oppresses you and millions of people like you. And you know what Dr. King said about all of that? About bootstraps. That there was folly. I'm paraphrasing him now. Paraphrasing Dr. King. That there was folly in asking a people to pull themselves up by the bootstraps when they don't have any bootstraps in the first place. To pull themselves up with. And yet... Day after day, when I used to watch all this stuff, what I call noise, because all of this is really noise, isn't it? Some might say that I'm noise too. (laughs) So I'm not excluding me from any of this. But what I am saying is that there would be times, especially during 2020, when the pandemic was really exploding and continues to explode. We now have nearly, well, we probably have at the time you hear, by the time you hear this, it will be over 540,000 people dead in the United States from coronavirus. My God, we're going to get to a million people dead before the end of the year, even with these vaccines. And from some people who are refusing to take them. Gosh, and these numbers become meaningless to some people. But we've got to keep talking about the people behind the numbers. I will endeavor to do that again in short order before too long. But when the pandemic was really um, hitting people and beginning, we were just beginning to see how this was hitting the US and around the world. And we'll soon get to 3 million people around the world from this virus who are dead from this virus. And there were people like Magic Johnson and Charles Barkley talking down to black people talking down to us, telling us, well, and you could just see them wagging their finger in a verbal way. You could hear the finger wagging. You know when someone talks to you and they're scolding you or admonishing you and you can visualize that finger being wagged at you without actually seeing it. You can visualize it in your mind's eye and so that their verbals sound like a finger literally being wagged in your face at you. And that's what Magic Johnson and co. were doing. They are multi-millionaires. I think Magic Johnson's a billionaire. And very comfortable. Their families are very comfortable. And I'm all for that. I'm not complaining about them being rich. I've got no envy about that. Again, you know, it's like the uh, Ten Commandments of Success. If not the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments of Success by Dr. Benjamin Mays, who mentored Dr. King. Envy no man his grand possessions. And I do not. I don't envy people for being rich. Uh, Why? Why would I do that? That's a complete waste of time. That's negative energy that I'll never get back. (laughs) Why would I want to sit here and be jealous or envious of anybody? I've said this before. I just think it's wasted time. And I know, again, it comes from fear and insecurity. But why would I invest, even if I had those kinds of fears or insecurities about something else, that we all have fears and insecurities. But even if I did about a certain person or certain people, why why would I? I don't know. Maybe I just, I don't know. Someone can probably drop me a line at politocratpod at gmail.com and let me know. Seriously. I mean, I, I don't know what that's about. I honestly don't. Maybe it's because I was brought up differently. Maybe it's because I don't know. I, it, it just, I, I don't know. I, I really do not know. But wag, wagging your finger at us is not going to change the situation. And that's what all that was. It's part of the, what I call, and what Noam Chomsky before me called and wrote books on, and documentaries, manufactured consent. If you can just pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you'll be like us. You'll be rich. You'll be a success. And no, that's not how it works. 
I mean, it was all about that. I remember these special programs that Don Lemon would host. And it would all be about assimilating into this system that oppresses. And you'd have all these celebrities making all of these comments about do this, wear a mask, do that. Fine, that's all good. But no one really speaking to the actual pain and the issues that face black people. No one was talking about that, really. I mean, they talk about it in general strokes. And then you'd have Magic Johnson scolding people in his home state of Michigan. Oh, you're going out with that. I mean, it, and that's what the corporate news media that's controlled by rich white male executives does best. It does what I call and what Reagan used to call low intensity warfare. Instead of having someone white doing this, scolding some black folk, and the Republicans still do it. They don't give a rat. They'll get some black folk to do it. They'll get some black folk to talk down to you who are famous and scold you while not scolding the very system that oppresses you and that causes and creates the poverty and the violence of it in the first place. That's the insidious thing that gets done to us. So when I say is a society changing or is society changing, I would say a big Hell no, it ain't. I mean, have there been changes? Of course. I am not going to sit here and say, has society... I'm not going to say society has never changed. Segments of it have. And people have died for that. So let's not forget that, shall we? The system itself has not really changed that much. I mean, there are things that have changed... But there are things that have stayed very much where they are. And there are other things that have got even worse. Such as the stripping of the Voting Rights Act. Thank you very much, Supreme Court. June of 2013. We couldn't do this without you. Yeah, let's get rid of Voting Rights Section 4. So that now we don't have to, as a federal entity, we don't have to be informed by state governments. They don't have to tell us anything. State governments don't have to tell us that they're implementing changes to their voting laws and their voting systems. They can just downright, outright do it. And they have. And they're continuing to do it. Which is why you've got all this legislation now that's really hurting the vast majority of black folk and brown folk and some poor white folk and some progressives and natives and Asian voters, all of which, all of whom are suffering can't vote this day, can't vote that day. It's really, no, we can't do any early voting now. Oh, we saw how successful it was last year, didn't we? Oh, we can't have that again. Oh, no. And this is what is happening. You've got Republicans ruling in apartheid fashion. So that what you're going to have is this minority rule, minority meaning numerical, because I don't regard black people or brown people as a minority because I think of a global perspective, not just a country perspective. And I don't mean country as in I'm a hillbilly. I mean, and no offense to hillbillies. I apologize. I mean country as in the United States. So the system is getting worse It's not changing at all. As I say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Or actually, the more things change, the worse they get, at least in some areas. And so while I celebrate, it's a good personal thing for Janet Yellen, who I'm sure has lots of business entrenchments. I know she does, as do all the rest of them. Senator, I keep saying Vice President Harris and Lloyd Austin, the Defense Secretary, Deb Harland, I don't know if she does. But... My whole point is, is that that's their personal success and that's great, but that really doesn't translate to the rest of us or to the rest of us in general, black folk, brown folk. The system does not change for women at large because you have Janet Yellen as your treasury secretary. The system does not change at large for Native Americans because you've got Deb Haaland as interior secretary. It may mean that for a Native American, they can look at Deb Holland as an inspiration and say, yeah, she can do that. And if I want to do that, 
I can perhaps strive to do that. That's what it does. That's all individualized. But I'm talking collectively. Collectively, it does not change a thing for Native Americans. And collectively, when we see Lloyd Austin as defense secretary, it does not change a thing for black people. Because what if Lloyd Austin dropped bombs on a brown country or a black country, or in this case, a brown country like Syria? Oh, yeah, that actually happened, didn't it? Oh, yeah, that happened last month, actually about a month ago today or thereabouts. Yeah, there was or maybe it's two days from now because it was Thursday, February the 18th. I think those bombs were dropped. I can remember these dates when I want to. So March 18th is this Thursday. So that will be a month. Oh, yeah. And yeah, he dropped bombs and said, oh, we hit the targets. So if a black man is defense secretary and he's dropping bombs, 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 or Iran, Syria, Iraq, Grenada. You know, I can go down the list of, of countries. Japan, bomb, 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 bomb. Name a country that's brown or black or yellow. You'll probably have found some shrapnel from the United States munitions and bombs um, somewhere there. Arms from the U.S. Come on. I'm not making this up. Just look at the last 100 years of United States foreign policy. There's enough information there, you know. It's there. You can see it. I'm not making this up. And so what use is it? I mean, yes, again, it's nice to have different faces and inclusiveness. But this is inclusiveness in a system that is oppressing you. So what good is that in the end? Well, it's good to have diverse faces and voices that may be able to change some of the policy. Or at least alter it or soften it. Or maybe not. Maybe amplify it. Because when you put, sometimes you put people who are black or brown or female in positions, they just continue to carry out the same patriarchy. Only with a black face or a female face and being or a brown face. That happens all the time. But if Lloyd Austin, the defense secretary, is dropping bombs on black and brown countries... Does it make a difference? I mean, black folk, surely we are not sitting here going, well, again, and I will speak for, on this occasion, I will speak for, well, maybe not. I shouldn't ever. Are black people really sitting around saying, well, I want to be like Lloyd Austin. I want to drop bombs on people. (laughs) I mean, that's a really crude way of putting it. And perhaps a little unfair by yours truly. But do, 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 I mean, do you find that that's what's going on? Or do we want change at large for us on an everyday basis? Do we want that? I think we want the latter. I don't think that we want to be lorded into the entry levels of power to do these malevolent things. And sometimes good things when it comes to some of these positions. Because some of these positions of power entail good, positive things. Like a more healthier environment. The Interior Secretary deals with that, like dealing with these pipelines that Jane Fonda highlighted in video, I think, yesterday. This company, Enbridge, which is a foreign company, I think they're from Canada, and they're doing on this pipelining that they're doing. It's horrible. Through native lands and all kinds, it's just in this country, the US of A. So, I mean, we really have to examine what it means when we say Is there real change? Is society changing? I don't know that it is. Because if you really wanted a change in society, you'd have an even bigger American rescue plan, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you make that a five trillion? I'm not trying to be greedy. But I'm just trying to say, wouldn't that be a real... I mean, 1.9 trillion is nothing to sneeze at. I almost said nothing to sleaze at. (laughs) I mean, the Republicans think that's sleazy. But then again, they don't think that drugging a woman and forcing her to have an abortion, they don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. 
They don't think there's anything violent about it. They don't think there's anything wrong with it. They don't think there's anything problematic about that at all. They don't think it's criminal. And then you've got these people on TV, the very people who did this, slipping pills in women's drinks. Jason Miller, disgusting human being. He he slips it. And he, this guy, I, I you know, anyway, I am going to stop right there. I have had it with these folks. Governor Cuomo, really? Do we really want to aspire to be in the levers of power when people are behaving like that? When you have a system, and I'm going to link to this article too by Rebecca Traster. It's a lengthy read. I will warn you in advance for those of you who don't like to read or don't like to read things that take more than 20 minutes to read. But it's a lengthy read. This article that she wrote in the New York magazine, in New York, not the New Yorker, in New York magazine, Rebecca Traister, T-R-A-I-S, as in Sam, T-E-R, Traister, Rebecca Traister. I will put a link to it. It's a lengthy article about Governor Cuomo and this system of, I know it doesn't make for great happy reading, but it's something you need to read. Really important. This system that women are walking into when they go into Governor Cuomo and work for him. I mean, is that what we want to be? We want to be, I mean, we want to have political power and representation. We just have to resolve not to get involved in or become what these people are. Scumbuckets like Governor Cuomo, we don't want that. We want to revolutionize the system or get rid of it, quite frankly. And build a system that actually respects black people, respects women of all backgrounds, respects transgender people, respects Everybody, native people, Latinos, Latinx, Asian, everybody, 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 everybody. That's what we want. That's going to take all of us to fight for each other's causes. No more of this, I fight for you, but you don't fight for me stuff. And that's not good enough now. And I will fight in all of these causes I would like to think that people would fight for black folk, for for the things that we care about as black people. I would love for that. But the reality is, is that some people aren't going to. And that, however, is not going to stop me from continuing to fight for your cause. Because I believe in that. Right? I'm not going to let someone's failure to support my cause stop me from speaking truth about their own cause. However, I really am tired of people who just don't say a damn word when Breonna Taylor is murdered and gunned down while she sleeps. I really am tired of some people's deafening silence when Trayvon Martin is killed by George Zimmerman. I really am tired of the deafening silence when Tamir Rice, a kid, is murdered by police on sight, executed. I'm tired of that silence. I'm tired of when nobody in these so-called feminist movements says a goddamn word about Sandra Bland. Most of these, not most of them, some of the people in these so-called movements say a nothing burger when it comes to Sandra Bland. Suddenly they don't see her as, oh, she is she a woman? It's like the whole Sojourner Truth rejoinder. Ain't I a woman too? I mean, and it is International Women's Year. And it is International Women's Century. And it is Women's History year so I've had enough of that you know I will and I'm not doing this because I you know I'm not fighting for someone else's cause because I just want to do that it's because I believe in it truly from deep within I believe that we cannot have a society where women are being violated and oppressed and their opportunities being shrunk I believe in a society that makes it clear that women must be allowed to
to realize their full potential, period, and have their own businesses. And they have many of their own businesses, but more. And not just that you want to be the head of a Fortune 500 company. Yeah, that's nice, I'm sure. But some of those companies don't do great things on behalf of women. They really don't. But are women, should women be allowed to have more representation? Women of all groups, not just white women, black women, everybody. Of all, should they be? Of course. But that's not what I'm about. I am about, I mean, I am about having more women be in these positions. But my whole thing is, how about having women in society at large elevated into positions of progress? Women who make $2 an hour waitressing, I'm talking about. Women who have a job at the grocery store. Women who are flight attendants. And some of them get paid, well, I don't know. I'm not in that world. I, but put it this way. Women at large is what I'm talking about. That's what I mean. I'm not talking about the Carly Fiorinas or the Sheryl Sandbergs or I'm talking or, or, you know, I'm talking about everyday women, the women that you see when you walk down the street, wherever you are. I'm talking about you. Where the standards of living are better. Where... The toxic masculinity is a thing of the past. Where men unlearn and stop the violence against women. Where boys are taught at an early age to respect girls and respect women. And to turn inward and not be violent and seek help when you feel angry. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about boys and men unlearning. And instead of creating a society where we're protecting, protecting women from these ravenous wolves, it should be, you need to turn these damn ravening wolves into lambs. That's what we need to be doing. It's not about, oh, I mean, that's so paternalistic. When you think about that for five seconds, oh, protect women. I mean, I'm all for, obviously, I want a safer environment for women, period, full stop. But I think when you say protect women, there's something to me in a patriarchal society and culture that is so inherently paternalistic about that. I'm certainly not against protect women. I'm against the context that that comes in. Because the context is, oh, if we can only protect women then everything would be fine and and not putting the onus on the violent men that's what that's my problem right is that we've got to put the onus on the violent man right and the placard should say turn violent men into lambs i know that's not necessarily soundbite friendly or bumper sticker friendly but that's really what this has got to be about doesn't it you ask me if Society is changing. What do you think your answer is? Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.